Doran Bassan is a producer, engineer, songwriter, and DJ originally from New England. After he worked on his production and DJ craft as a youth, he then moved to Jamaica where he cut his teeth in the dance hall and reggae production sound. He then brought those skills back to the States where he co-founded a production studio called Subdecibel Sound. Let's go check them out now. I've always been curious about the creative process. I mean, what's that cosmic itch that absolutely must be scratched? And maybe even more than that, once they've started on that creative journey, what's the thing that helps someone take a project from the beginning to the finish? In this series, I'll be talking to industry professionals about their process, and I'll be asking them questions like, what's the best place to start? The best kind of equipment to use? What exactly does that button do? My name is Watson, and this is Making Noise. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Of course. It's Thanks for coming by. You. Yeah, show Super me around. Dope. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, so let's get into it a little bit. I actually just like to start with your background. So you're from New England. I am. I'm yeah. from the Boston area. Okay. Cambridge, Newton, you right know, on, the right greater on. Boston area. So, okay. but that was the first 18 years and then uh, did school up in Maine for four years, mm -hmm. then came right to New York, 2000. Oh, right on. That was it. So what was uh, the music scene like in Newton? What was going on there? What wow. were people listening to when you were coming up? <laughs> what was the scene like in Newton when I was growing up? Well, uh, when I was growing up, it was my world was heavily hip hop influenced, mm -hmm. '90s hip hop. You know, Big Daddy Kane, EPMD, that whole gamut right on, of right things. On, yeah. You know, that that era. So heavily influenced by that in my world. Um, then in high school, did more like band oriented things. Worked mm -hmm. with a lot of you know musicians, instrumentalists. Um, I was a rapper at the time, so I, I did a lot of vocal things with them, wrote nice. music that way, and then started DJing a little bit later in high school too. Yeah. Oh, cool stuff. So you were saying that you uh, you went to college in Maine. I did. And were you can, did you continue your music? I did. There? I did, uh, you know, I played in a few bands. Mm -hmm. I, I produced, that was actually really where I got my production start. Uh -huh. I had a little, uh, little sampler, an S20 uh, Akai, and I would like make my little beats on there with mm -hmm. my floppy disks or my, my little hard hard disks that I put in there. And uh, I had some kind of computer thing going on, but it was pretty rudimentary at yeah, that yeah, point. Yeah. You still have those floppies? I do. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I can show them to you. Yeah. So I also read that at some point you made your way down to Jamaica. I did. That was like, well, I made my way down as a child because I was okay. brought there quite a bit. Um, in my my uh, young high school, even elementary school mm -hmm. days, um, just really for like family trips slash business trips that yeah. my mom would take. And then after I graduated from college in 2000, I met my partner there. And then we we worked a little bit in Jamaica. Then I, I left, came back to Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. We lost touch for about six months. Then he hit me up on the phone and said, you should come down and we should do some collaborations down here. Mm -hmm. And at first I wasn't sure because I didn't know him that well. And he just wanted to bring me into his neighborhood. And I said, all right, you know, let's give it a shot. Mm -hmm. Went down there, we started collabing and pretty much the rest was, uh, was history. How did you discover, I don't know if that's even the right word. How did you discover reggae dance hall? Like, how did you decide like, let's, this opportunity is here, let's go down, let's really dig our teeth into this sure. music. Sure. I, I have to say that I discovered reggae and dance hall through my love of, of hip hop okay. in the 80s and 90s, because whatever would play alongside mm -hmm. of those tunes, like if it was a super cat or a Shaba tune, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. something, and usually there would be like a hip hop remix, like a Salam Remy right. kind of thing, or maybe you would have like, a rapper featured on you know like mm -hmm. the remix so it was like a it was a crosstalk going yeah, yeah, on yeah. there so yeah i think that's really where my first sort of knowledge of of popular current contemporary at the time yeah dance hall and reggae came from was like what was being played in the sets like whether it was like the ghetto red hot super cat remix right alongside of you know maybe something else like uh Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre deep cover or something, mm -hmm. you know, it's like that, yeah. that era, 90, you know, right. 91. But. And during this whole time, you were DJing as well, just sort of like... I wasn't DJing you know? yet. My okay. friends were DJing, but I think it was a funny thing in high school because only one person could do one thing. Like there was like the DJ guy, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. if he was doing it, then I guess you weren't doing it. Right. So I was the rapper, and gotcha. my friends were the DJs. Mm -hmm. 
and other guys were the producers and other guys were the musicians. Yeah. So everybody kind of like played their role, so to speak. Right, right, right. So I think that's what led me to DJ after high school because mm. now I wasn't in that environment. Yeah. So I was somewhere else so I could do something else. So at what point do you think you decided like, all right, I think I want to give a, this music thing a go. I really want to try to make it a career or... I think, I think uh, the first time that I decided that I wanted to really give it a go was when we did uh, the first album that got released on a major label or okay. a, a record label. Mm -hmm. They're not a major, but a, an indie label, a VP Records. Mm -hmm. So um, after we had that placement on I Wayne's record, mm -hmm. uh, Lava Ground, mm -hmm. which is right up there. Uh, <laughs> we. Uh, we thought about it in a little bit more serious way because mm -hmm. I think when we started making music, it was really just for the love. We yeah. didn't think about where any of this was going, but once it became something real, a lot of our friends were in our ear like, what are you going to yeah, do now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, what? now you have to get serious. Now you have mm -hmm. to do X, Y, and Z. And it was kind of a rude awakening. Hmm. So we're like, oh, now we have to be real. And that brings on a whole other set of expectations that you put on yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Because then it's graduating from the, I'm just doing this for myself part to I'm doing this for other people now. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like a head trip. Yeah. Let me ask you this, because I'm curious about how people, you know, as a DJ, how people kind of decide what software that they use. My theory is just kind of whatever the first one is, where someone get, or if someone you know uses this and they show you, and sure. that's the one that you use. So how did you end up on Logic? I ended up on Logic because it was given to me for free. And yeah. somebody <laughs> gave me the disc. It was uh, my buddy Eli mm -hmm. and uh, Big Up Eli. Shout out. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he gave me 4.8 cracked on a disc for my Mac. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used it faithfully and I got to know it. And then once I knew it, I just kept going with that. Then I had a cracked version on a PC for many years, mm -hmm. and uh, once Logic hit 6.0, it was only Mac. Like they they abandoned mm -hmm. PC. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, that this is this is it for me. I have to just get a Mac. Yeah. yeah. And I have to have because I had the PC going and it was fine, but I wanted to be up to date. I wanted yeah. to be 6.0, not mm -hmm. 5.5. Right. So I got the Mac and that was it. And there you go. And there you go. Now. Six 6.0 to 10.5. But I'm, but I'm not, you know, and I'm not just exclusive to yeah. Logic. Mm -hmm. I, I, I work with Ableton. I work with Fruity Loops sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Pro Tools if I have to. Okay. Give me the examples of why you would use a different program. Is that based on an artist or a different type of sound? Well, I would say for me it's functionality. Okay. For example, I love using Logic because it has a feature that uh, is really good for comping vocals, okay. uh, for example, which just means taking different parts and selecting them as, as you need. So you can do what's called a track stack. So mm -hmm. essentially you could set like a four bar loop or an eight bar loop and you could just keep recording over the same eight bars again mm -hmm. and again. Keep taking okay. take after take after take, but you're not actually recording over yourself. Oh, you're recording new takes yeah, over yeah, the yeah. same chunk. Mm -hmm. So Logic does that extremely well. Okay better than anything else. Yeah. So if I'm gonna track vocals, it's gonna be Logic. Gotcha. Absolutely. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about producing, about how you approach a track. So you have an idea, you know, is it a thing where you've got an idea, let me find someone to get on this track, or does someone, an artist come to you because they've heard stuff you've done in the past and let's work together. It can um, really be all of the above. Yeah. It could be Usually I like to call myself like a vibe producer. Okay. So I, I look towards a flavor or a vibe and I try to capture that the best mm -hmm. that I can. So if it's for an artist, I'll try to complement really what the artist can do, mm -hmm. but also I'll try to create a palette that gives a direction at the same mm -hmm. time. Something that you're doing now, I guess you were telling me earlier that you have been doing for a couple of years, you're now starting to develop artists a bit more. That's right. And start from you know, a new person that wants to get into it. Maybe you've heard them before, heard them sing or something like, let's work together. Let's really try to make something happen. Let's talk a little bit about that process. So you have an artist, DeAndre, that you're working with now. That's right. Um, so how, let's talk a little bit of, let's use her as an example. How did you guys connect and decide to start working together? 
It was pretty organic. We uh, we connected through another artist that was tracking in here mm -hmm. and doing some production with us. She came by for a session one day just to basically look in and hang out and she was involved in some music and we said, well, let's try to make something. Mm. And really just organically started messing around, got some flavors that were pretty cool and uh, decided to basically hone the sounds. Okay. Initially, a lot of the, the songs that we were making were good, but they didn't have a full direction. Okay. And I think after a while we had to ask ourselves, well, what is this project? Yeah. Who are you as an artist? How do you want to be seen? How do you want to be perceived? Mm -hmm. And then we pretty much went from that, mm -hmm. that point of view. In terms of developing an artist, you know, what are some ways that you help mentor or help bring them along? Are, are there assignments that you maybe give them or you give them things to think about? What's the process of like, all right, we're, we want to make you a thing. We want to pull out the best pieces of you and we want to find a direction. How do you find that direction? Sure, yeah, I think that's a really important thing uh, when making an artist have an, a, a palette or an aesthetic because one thing that I like to do is discuss with the artist not who they sound like, but who they would be complimented by. So say you're making a playlist, like who would be in your playlist? Would you be with this artist, that artist? Because that way it's a little bit more disarming than saying you sound like this person, right. where they might say, well, I'm my own person. I don't sound like this person. That yeah. person's cool, but I'm cooler or yeah, something right, or, right. or whatever it may be. So I think, yeah, just like finding the palette, finding, you know, your contemporaries, your peers, so to speak, like who's in my sound, you know, like, I don't think it's terrible to have your own completely unique out of the box sound, but it's not always going to lend itself well to finding a home in the music arena. If you're just like totally left field, yeah. it's like, where does that play? Who listens to that? You know, asking all those sort of quantifiable questions that may not seem creative at the time, but right. like, who's the audience for this? Like, is this a thing even? Like, will people dance to this? Right, right, totally. Things like of that nature. Yeah. So, okay, so once you've had those conversations and you're like, all right, this is what we think we want to do. This is the sound that we want to have. Maybe you've even made a few playlists of songs, is that, does that come in at all? Of songs oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. And making playlists is also a big part of how our creative process of streamlining works also. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of private SoundCloud uh, playlists mm -hmm. where we'll share that with each other. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and basically from that point, be able to streamline and cut down what doesn't work. Right. And we'll just keep making new playlists of uh, you know, our new material. Right getting it out that way. So let's get, dig into a little bit of the songwriting process when you're working with these artists. So, and maybe I assume a lot of this kind of happens at the same time, but you know, maybe you've made a few songs and then through that process, you figured out this is the sound we want to do. This is, this is how we're going to go for it. How do you tend to approach the songwriting process? Um, you know, do you, do you like to have ideas already for the artists when they come in? Do you like to have them come in with the ideas for the tracks and then you work on those? How do you... Like yeah, that's a good question. I like to do both actually, especially when it's a new person that I've never met before. I'd like to have at least one canned idea and that's like the party starter. And if it doesn't start, then we just go to something new. Gotcha. But that'll be the tester. I'll study that person. I'll say, okay, I've got like maybe this element. It won't be a full fledged, fleshed out beat. It'll be more of uh, something that's uh, like a like a starter, like like a piano line or just one piece that maybe they could get inspired off of. But if that doesn't go well, I just go with something new. Gotcha. And do you do that as a thing to, like you said, maybe it's a piano or a pad or something. Is it to see how you work together? Maybe also as a test of like, all right, let's see because I can imagine if you have a sample or a little melody, you probably in your head can already think of, this is the type of drum I do on it. This is the type of bass I do on it. Sure. But with that artist, do you kind of sit back and say, let me see what they offer here. Let's see where their head is. Yeah, absolutely. Even with, uh, with DeAndre, we started off the project doing a lot of electronic bass drums. Yeah. And then we switched 
at some point saying that the vibe needs to be something that's more grungy, a little bit more like sample based, something that sounds more like hip hop. Gotcha. So we wanted that boom bap quality to go with it. And that definitely dictated what kind of sound, what kind of programming we were even gonna do. So yeah. it was really like going into like exploring more 90s hip hop. Mm -hmm. so okay, and then does that, at that point, does that, I imagine more playlists come with that. Yeah, that's it's like, all right, more references. More references, and references mm -hmm. because you're, you're, you're playing, you know, yeah. classic tunes mixed with newer tunes that it's more of really for anything and for the music that we're doing, it's about continuing the conversation. Yeah. You know, it's like, I feel like anything that's good that you're making now should just be continuing that dialogue. Yeah. Like, okay, I'm referencing the 90s, but I don't sound like I'm stuck in the 90s, but I'm bringing something new to it that's a nod to that. Yeah. And I feel like if you can bring all those things together, then you're doing your job. Yeah, yeah, totally. Do you mind uh, sharing with us uh, maybe a couple pieces of advice? for someone who's trying to get into what you're doing. So first we'll talk about someone who maybe wants to be an engineer. Maybe something that you learned on the way up that would be like, hey, if you learn this, you know, that'll help you on your way. Sure thing. I would say just simply follow your ears and don't look at the screen too much and go with the frequencies that are doing something for you. Do you have a piece of advice for someone who wants to help develop artists? My advice for someone that wants to develop an artist is to look for an artist that knows themselves and isn't doing it for the wrong reasons. And that really is about being an artist because there are a lot of, and this is not, no shade on anybody in particular, but I see a lot of Instagram artists out there that don't have any music and they've got the whole look, they've got the whole package going but then when you're like digging for the music there's no music to be found yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like where is the music yeah. <laughs> so I want the music first and I want the image second image is great I love image yeah. but I really I'm a music first kind of guy and do you have any advice for someone who's looking to get into production my advice for anybody looking to get into production is to not spend a lot of money on unnecessary things like I did. <laughs> and uh, really just start simple and try to, to just hone something that's genuine and not to over layer. Cause like every other early producer back in the day, I did a lot of like layer cake throw the kitchen sink in kind of stuff and you think that adding the next piece is going to get you to the finish point but then you realize that you have to throw that all out the window go back to basics go back to like you know foundational sounds and i guess one of my biggest pieces of advice is when i was first starting all this i made the mistake of trying to create too many uh templates of things that were MIDI oriented that that weren't necessarily focused around a sound mm. but now everything I try to make has to have one at least one specific sound that's captivating mm. so that's one of the reasons why I use live synthes synthesizers in synthesis is because I find it a lot easier to get in uh, to that sound palette it's more immediate yeah. if you're just hitting uh, an actual sound that sounds good rather than saying well I'll, I'll fix it in post you know I'll, I'll find the better sound later yeah, yeah, yeah. and I did a lot of that in the beginning trying to like carve out sketches and things and oh I'll get the better bass later but when you don't have the better bass and you're trying to find it later that maybe you don't find it later <laughs> I see so you're saying more like do some of your sound design early find those sounds yeah find the things that actually work and and the other thing that I find very useful is that when you're playing an instrument that already has a good sound it will lend the idea to you rather than you playing an idea and trying to find the sound that fits yeah. that idea, mm -hmm. the sound will dictate the idea that you're going to play. Oh, interesting. Dope. Well, right. I appreciate you, man. Appreciate Yo, you. Yo, thanks for coming by. The time, showing yeah. me around. It was dope. It was amazing. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Cheers. And that's today's show. 
I'd like to thank Dorian for joining us today. If you'd like to learn more about his work, please check out the links in the description box below. Also, if you haven't already, make sure you hit those like and subscribe buttons. Thank you for watching. My name is Watson. Peace.